That's not a comic book. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Comic Reviews. I hope all is going well in the world. Um, we have a pretty decent amount of books to talk about tonight, and I am getting a late start because my mother came over for dinner. My wife made chili. She was very impressed. It's a very, very nice relationship here between the in-laws and such at the Harrington household. Um, anyway... Hope everyone is had a good week, having a good new comic book day and all that jazz. In any way, in any case, uh, since it's off to a late start, why don't we just go ahead and talk about what we'll be talking about. This is usually about the time I want to end comic reviews, not begin them. <laughs> so here we go. Tonight we'll discuss briefly the Marvel preview. Oh, I've got this all backwards. All right, let's try that again. Tonight we'll be talking about Power Rangers, number 33. Justice League Odyssey, number 3. Batman Beyond, number 26. Wonder Woman, number 59. I have to go off the glare. Heroes in Crisis, number 3. Action Comics, number 1005. Darth Vader, number 24. And we'll briefly talk about the Marvel Comics preview. Let's go ahead and get started and talk about Power Rangers, number 33. So, like, I have this really weird thing with this book where every time I start an issue, I'm kind of just like, eh, I don't know if this is really working for me, if I'm super interested in this. But then I get, like, halfway through it, and it's just the fact that this is how Margaret Bennett writes. This is how she she makes characters, and I really like it, or or I like a lot about it. I should say. Um, I was so like I, I picked this up today just off the stands again because I'm just going for the first arc and I want to see where that goes. And I was like, it's it's all right. It's 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 been fine. And then I started reading. And I'm like. Man, I really like this, and I really like this thing, and I like what she's doing here. And so I just, I don't know, I'm having that, that thing where a lot of people follow writers and artists, not characters. And I am very much the other way around. I, even when I hate a book um, that a writer is on, I'll usually stick with it for entirely too long. Um, and I don't know, this just... This is, like, really well written. I like what's being done with it, but I just don't have any interest in Power Rangers, so I'm just having a really hard time getting super invested in it. So this is, like, the most useless review to anyone else in the world, I'm assuming, because, like, people want to know what I think of the Power Rangers comic, and I think it's a really good comic that I just don't care about that much. Like, I really enjoy it. I think it's well-written. I think it's doing... It's Margaret Bennett doing all the things that I love that Margaret Bennett does. But I just don't give a shit about Power Rangers. So I'm just like... I'm having a lot of trouble getting invested in it. And, and what's weird is, like... It's barely even a Power Rangers book at this point. It's... It, it's like they're in a space sector region without their powers, almost. Or with very limited access to their powers. They've been nerfed, aha, using the young people's lingo. Um, they they don't have a lot of um, a lot of like morphin. There's no Zord fights or anything like that. So it it really is just a lost in space Star Trek Voyager comic, really. And I'm liking all the characters. It's all completely original characters not like it's just this the same character continued on from the series or anything I just don't care I'm just so not invested in it even though Margaret Bennett does a great job with all these characters um feedback us feedback us never back Ian um weird Okay. I don't know what you mean by that, Philip Colton. Um, 
I don't know. It's just... I just don't care enough about it. So I'm going to stick with it for another issue or two and see if, like, just the strength of her writing alone can get me through this, but I just don't care about Power Rangers enough. Um, there was a moment in this I thought was kind of interesting because I, I kind of talked about how um, the, the Solar Ranger uh, is like got this weird art style going on her in the last issue and it, it kind of just has the overlay thing similar to what Mitch Gerards does in Mr. Miracle when um when things are like wrong uh and yeah there we go there's a good image of it where it's like slightly out of focus overlaid kind of thing I talked about that and I thought oh that's just kind of there randomly it doesn't really mean anything there's a story reason for it it has to do with like her ability to tap into her powers as incredibly um uh her, her ability to tap into her powers is incredibly glitchy and and based heavily on her emotions so any kind of emotional derangement can can really throw her her morphine ability off and i'm like that's really interesting and cool and it's a great justification for this very distinct distinctive move artistically but I'm still just like, it's Power Rangers. It's not my property. It's not my circus, not my monkey. Um, yeah. That's all I got. Short review. Go ahead and move on and talk about Justice League Odyssey number three. Siege has gone. I'm not invested enough in this book. Based solely on the writing to to continue to care about it um it's not that the new artist on it is bad but it makes very odd choices mm, that's a weird transition of panels uh, Jessica Cruz goes from looking like Jessica Cruz to looking like she's been possessed. And that's weird. So, um... I don't really have a way to demonstrate this, I don't think. Which is too bad. Um... When I took theater back in high school, we did a, a whole, like, two days, or, or no, it was like a whole week on lighting, and, and stage lighting, and uh, choices to make with stage lighting, and, and how um, color can have certain moods, or, or make scenes look a certain way, and the teacher said, do not, under any circumstances, use green lighting because if you do anything just slightly wrong your actors will look like they're deathly sick and ill on stage and so if you're an artist you obviously have much more control but if you're kind of fumbling around or doing stuff that you're not 100 percent comfortable with and you're using green as your lighting and shading, or your, your colorist is using green on your lighting and shading, you can make your character look deathly ill or sickly. What she's supposed to be looking like here is like she's surging with energy all of a sudden, but it just, ah, it looks really weird. And so when I, I got on the book for an artist that I love, and due to circumstances, he's no longer on the book, I just immediately become much more critical of the art. And so it's not that every panel in this is bad. It's that I look at it, and I know it was scripted for Sejic, and I know how much better it could have been. So anything that's cool and done well, I know could have been even better. Anything that's slightly off or done poorly... I know wouldn't have been that way. And that's not even necessarily true, right? That's the thing. is like, I understand that 
this artist has different capabilities and everything. I get it. But... Just, man, does it change stuff. <sighs> Jake Carlson says, why isn't he on the book? There was, like, a huge miscommunication during the, um, the initial workup of the art for issue one of Justice League Odyssey. And so he had to go back and redo all the art for the first issue. Or, or large portions of it, which threw off his schedule. And then he, because of a lack of ability to communicate around Comic-Con, he got even further behind on the book. And so it was already delayed because of the screw-up with issue one. And they didn't want it to be delayed further because this is meant to be tying into the whole no justice stuff. So they had to drop him after two issues. Uh, he couldn't meet the scheduling that they needed because of how tight his scheduling is with his own books and his other pitch that he put into DC. Um, so a little bit like we screwed up and I screwed up and, and kind of thing. Um, so it's just unfortunate. Just I, I understand that this artist, who is it? Um, Felipe Brani's? Um, is is certainly capable of like good stuff. I don't want to try to um, shit on his work or anything. It's it's really good stuff when it's good. But just in my head, I'm like, oh, this could have been better. And I know that Cjix certainly capable of stuff that looks awkward or weird or bad too. Any artist is. But just in my head, it would have been better. And honestly, I paid too much for comics this week. When I'm not feeling something like this, I can't justify paying four bucks for it. So this book is getting dropped. Nothing against the artist. And, and Williamson I was just here for just because he's I, I I don't love Williamson. I don't hate him either. He's okay. Uh, I was mainly interested in this book for two reasons. Jessica Cruz and Steven Sejic. Uh I love Steven Sejic. And, I don't know, just, Cruz, I really, really like you, even though I've not read much of anything with you. <laughs> and here we are. Jake says that the situation with CJ seems avoidable. I mean, maybe, if they communicated better around um, Comic-Con, surely, if they'd uh, been willing to push the book back for him, probably that, too. But he's not that big a name yet. Um... He's gonna be. Uh, I really feel like Cedric's gonna be up there with your your Rosses and your Andy Kuberts one day. Um, the fact that he has done a creator-owned book that is available for free for people to read the entirety of, and yet it still sells incredibly well to the point where some stores can't hold on to it um is a pretty good indicator that there's a lot of love for for cj in the industry there's there's a lot of interest in his art and the fact that he can write too uh his dialogue's a little shaky sometimes sometimes he gets wrapped up in in over explaining things but man if he does not understand characters uh, that dude does some great character work. <coughs> I should have brought some drink up. Anyway. So yeah, I mean, I just... I'm looking at, like, the covers that CJ's still doing for him. And it's so cool. Uh, I mean, just come on. It's got... It's got word balloons on the covers. That's always fun. Mmm. <laughs> Oh well. Can't wait to find out what his um his pitch is. Have I mentioned that on comic reviews? I'm almost certain I have. Uh, Steven Cedric, one of the reasons he couldn't continue on Odyssey as well is because he has a pitch in with DC that got approved. And he's being all hush-hush about what it is. It's Harleen. 
if you um, if you don't really know much about Steven Sejic, um, but are interested in him because I have so much reverence for him, uh, go search on just Google uh, S E J I C Sejic and Harleen, and he's done I think four or five bits of random black and white fan comic of a Harley Quinn origin essentially and it's not even like in any kind of really discernible order necessarily it's just a bunch of like and here's a scene and here's a scene and here's a scene and it's literally the best Harley Quinn has ever been written Paul Dini can just stop now um everyone else that's written Harley Quinn not even touching Sejic, in my humble opinion. Uh, so he made that, and he retweeted it all the time because it got super popular. And then he's like, oh, I've got a mystery pitch in with DC. And I've read that comic, those, those comics he put out, multiple times. And then he goes, oh, my pitch with DC has been approved. And then he keeps posting his Harley and Randoms, Harley and Randoms, and then one day he posts Harleen randoms, and suddenly a bunch of them are in color, which hadn't happened before. Another, and then there's a scene that wasn't ever released before. He's doing a Harleen. He's doing a Harley Quinn book. Hopefully Black Label. That would be awesome. All right. Let's go ahead and move along then and talk about... Batman Beyond, number 26. Dealt a deadly hand by the Joker. Um. <laughs> I swear I like this book. All I seem to do is make fun of and criticize it. But I swear I like this book. But at the same time, after the cliffhanger at the last issue... Okay, okay. So obviously the Joker's back. Last issue ended with a cliffhanger with Barbara Gordon coming into her office. And then there was the dramatic turn of the chair. And then the Joker was there. And he pointed his gun and fired. And then the, the cliffhanger, the page ended. Or the, the book ended. And it was like, he's even wearing like the, the Hawaiian shirt and everything. What could possibly have happened to Barbara Gordon, who's in like her 50s or 60s by the time you get to beyond? She dodged? <laughs> That's that is so anticlimactic <laughs> and just stupid. Um, just, yeah, she dodged the bullet. That was your big cliffhangers. Oh, no, the Joker's in her office, and he shot Barbara Gordon again. Except she dodged it. That's dumb. Um... Oh, really? Is Brett, Brett Booth's drawing this? Oh, that's awesome. I love Brett Booth. That's an odd choice for Barbara Gordon, police commissioner Barbara Gordon. <laughs> like, again, she, I get, you know, she's athletic and stuff. She used to be Batgirl and everything, but like... Did anyone working on this book watch a single episode of Batman Beyond? Just like one time. Like it was one thing when like Grant Morrison showed Barbara Gordon and and Damian Wayne existing at the same time in the Batman Beyond era. And like she was in a wheelchair and stuff still. Or, or when we first started doing Batman Beyond comics and we de-aged her a little and, and had her go with orange hair again. But like, come on! <laughs> <laughs> that is like Gilf Barbara Gordon 
it's it's such a weird idea. I don't know what's happening with this book. Like, and there's nothing wrong with Barbara Gordon being young or anything, but like at that point, it's not a bat. If you make everyone young and and spry, it's not a Batman Beyond book anymore. It's silly. Uh, so anyway, she dodged the bullet, beat up the Joker. And kicked him out a window, but wouldn't you know it, there was a taxi waiting just outside the window. And like obviously he planned it and everything, so that's not that's not bad writing, I guess. It's, it's ultra convenient writing, but it's not bad writing. Um, it's contrived, not convenient. Um it's whatever. Can I just be honest, like this is the worst arc? of the entire series, and yet this is what the entire series has been building up to. Like, this book has never been great, but it's been fun, if maybe a little too ham-fisted. But like, you've been building up to this for, for 25 issues, and this is what you got? I don't get it, man. I just don't get it. But then at the same time, yeah, I am really gra glad Brett Booth's on this. Because god damn, that's cool. Just damn, that is cool. Oh man, I love that. So yeah, Terry and Matt are saving the city, blah, 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 blah. This crap cracks me up because like, yeah, I get that this is in rebirth and everything, but it doesn't really matter that it's in continuity. They're just kind of doing whatever they feel like. But then we just get some moments like this where Dick Grayson's yelling at, Bat at Bruce Wayne for giving Matt a Robin costume. And he's like... I can't believe you gave that kid a Robin suit. You want to risk him being another Jason or getting a bullet to the brain? And Bruce is like, you were Nightwing when that happened. Matt's suit offers far more protection. Okay. All right. Hold on. Hold on. I'll go back to a nice big panel. All right? Okay. So here's an image of Matt in the Robin costume, right? Let's let's do some googling real quick cuz this is pretty funny. Do we have the image? Yeah, yeah, here we go. Okay, okay, okay. Got to get this up. Do the old do, do, do. All right. Oh, I'm on the wrong screen. And I'll throw this over here. All right, so there's the panel that this scene is referencing from Batman 57 of Dick Grayson getting shot in the head when he was Nightwing. And I'll put it up real close. Here's the image of Matt in the Robin costume. Dick Grayson got shot over the ear in the hair in the hair section of his head Matt's Robin mask stops at the hairline slightly above the ear and yet his costume offers far more protection <laughs> Overly bad. It's just kind of stupid. Um, it's just kind of dumb. And like, I feel like Jurgens didn't didn't read the the issue of Batman, or didn't even look, like bother looking at the panel of Nightwing getting shot in the head and what the design they they went with with Robin Beyond when he wrote that line. It's just like I feel like Dan Jurgens probably didn't watch more than an episode or two of of um batman beyond like i like things about this book quite a bit again 
This is fantastic. But man, some of the contrivances and stuff is just really funny. <laughs> um, anyway, the world of Gotham is confirmed that Robin Beyond exists. Uh, the Joker finds out about it and says, Oh boy, finally a goal worth working for. Something to shoot for. A shiny red and green target. Also, Joker looks way too young. I'm just beginning to get the sense that, that Brett Booth doesn't know how to draw old people. <laughs> uh, I love you, Brett Booth, but that might just be a, a problem you got. Um, anyway... Oh, Terry holds up some rubble, and Matt saves some people, and they work together as a team, proving that Batman does indeed need a Robin, so that was cool, I guess. Uh, oh, man, I do really like Brett Booth's style. Brett Booth is really... Uh, he's hes one of the few artists who I think can actually capture the, the Batman Beyond suit in comic form and just keep the original design but have it work it's maybe showing off a little too much of the anatomy um but it's it's working really well that that works for me in a way that other designs with the the costume and in comic form haven't um maybe it's the fact that it's more shading so anyway the world knows about uh about Robin Beyond and Bruce and the Bat family are made aware that the Joker is back because Barbara survived, of course. Um, Joker goes back to his hideout and goes, Ah, there you are. Tribute to my greatest moment ever. Glorious, wonderful, exhilarating. And now, at long last, time for the sequel. He's just got the crowbar framed and a giant Robin symbol spray painted on the wall. That's nice and dark. That's the kind of Joker writing I really do like. I cannot lie. Um, that's ah, that's twisted. That reminds me of an image from No Man's Land when I was reviewing that that I talked about. Um, See if I can find this one. There's this fantastic issue of No Man's Land where some people stumble into Joker, one of Joker's old hideouts. Um, the the Ha Ha Siendas, as they called them. Uh, love that name, by the way. Huh. No, let me try the day I won No Man's Land. Um... <laughs> No, that's not going to work. There's this great moment in an issue of No Man's of the No Man's Land saga where um, some people stumble into one of Joker's old hideouts and they find just a glass case of a Robin costume and a crowbar, and it just says like on a placard or something, "The day I won," and it's in reference to Jason Todd. And super fucking twisted. I always love that one. Really. Okay, so this is probably the worst possible way to show it, but I do think I have it on here. So it's going to have some shit in the way, but uh, give me a second. I'll need to switch these. Um, go away. Trade talk. Because I really do want to show that panel. I think it's a great panel. Uh, No Man's Land. There it is. Um, <laughs> that. It reminds me a lot of that, and that is just really, really cool. <laughs> uh, anyway. Now, it probably was way more payoff than it needed. I guess that's a fake Robin costume. I guess I didn't notice that the first time. 
Okay. Anyway. Oh, you probably didn't care enough about that, but hey. Ah! <laughs> Philip Kelton's throwing some shade at uh at the the setup of the crowbar. Uh I bet he's going to dodge the crowbar. <laughs> oh the savagery. So yeah, I don't know, I like it, but there's there's just some undeniable dumb in this book. The, that's kind of where I'm at. I'm like, I, I enjoy it. I legitimately enjoy this series. But man, there's some stupid shit in here sometimes. Alrighty. Let's go ahead and move along to the next issue then. Talk about Wonder Woman number 59. G. Willow Wilson continues to write Wonder Woman just absolutely fantastically. Uh, she's, this is only her second issue, so please jump in on this run now. If you are someone who's like, oh, I don't know if I want to read Wonder Woman, or, or I'm interested in Wonder Woman, but I don't even know where to begin, this is a good place to start. Um, one of the things with Wonder Woman that drives me crazy trying to read her uh, is people just avoid stuff with Wonder Woman. You hear stuff like... Um, Oh, it was the Finches. It was it was David Finch when he was doing his run on Wonder Woman with his wife. He straight said in, in an interview, like, oh yeah, we want to make her like powerful and and everything. I don't want to use the word feminist, but you know, like on equal footing. And I just wanted to like I know what he was trying to get at, but I just groaned and rolled my eyes. And it's just exhausting. There's this sense that, like, oh, Wonder Woman really shouldn't be too uppity or speak out of here or preachy. I'm like, no! She absolutely should be. You need to lean into that shit, man. Wonder Woman's great when it's like that. And, and the great thing here is Wonder Woman has some speeches or, or like, like moments of, of tri you know, heroic grandstanding in this, but, like, nothing more than you'd see in any other comic, really. Um... Just more telling the bad guy that they're a bad guy kind of thing. It's the situation that G. Will Wilson has written. Because I'm going to tell you right now. You know what this book's really about? Yemen. G. Will Wilson's first arc it's all wrapped up in comic book continuity and, and weirdness, like stuff that's going on in Justice League Dark, and so I'm enjoying that aspect of it too, and, and no justice and, and all that shit. Um, it gets all wrapped up in that, but here's the setting. There's a brutal dictatorship that is hurting uh, people who have formed a rebellion against the state and because the US is allied with the dictatorship they are supplying them weapons and helping them carry out military operations now that is not it is not a one-to-one -one comparison to Yemen I understand that the situation is ever so slightly more complicated than that but it's not. <laughs> um, it's it's really not the same. Um, it's kind of crazy. So, yeah, it's just it's such a great little political commentary about. We so often see Wonder Woman complacent and siding with the U.S. government when we know intrinsically that the U.S. government is not always on the right side of things. I'll, I, among lefties, am a little more generous to the U.S. government. And I will say, yeah, they do a lot of imperialist bullshit, but they're not always 100% motivated by self-interest. There are times when it's like, yeah, that's just someone should be doing something here. Uh, it shouldn't have to be the U.S., but 
you know, it, it could be worse. And maybe I'm just too brainwashed, I don't know, but, but regardless. Wonder Woman's become very complacent with the U.S. I mean, her boyfriend's a super secret spy soldier, and and her best friend runs a military division and all this stuff. So she comes across Ares, and it seems like, oh, he's turned over a new leaf, and he's fighting for good and justice, so he says. And they go to stop a missile headed for uh, rebel soldiers, and Wonder Woman says, into the fields then. And Ares says, no, here will do very nicely. And he throws it down at a populated village, which it immediately crashes into before Wonder Woman has time to act. And Ares celebrates. To turn the weapons of a tyrant against his own people, is there any greater poetry? <laughs> because... Yeah, that's fucked. Um, that's nice and fucky. I like that. Ares is so attuned to this justice thing now that he's not willing at all to look at the particulars. And so Wonder Woman immediately attacks him for what he's just done. Calls him a murderer, uh, and wraps the lasso of truth around him, uh, and says, You can't lie now. Tell me why you're really here, god of war, or I will throw you on the same pyre in which the children you killed are burning. And Ares says, I haven't told you a single lie. Those people supported the government. They stood by as their own neighbors were persecuted and debased. I have only done as you would do in my place. I, do you not carry a sword? I take up arms only against those who have done the same. Is the difference so clear? What is that? Your friends have brought their war chariots to aid their bloodied allies. They, but they will not succeed today. Stop, Ares, stop. And so Ares goes to attack American jets. And Wonder Woman's now got to try to save them. And just, ah, oh, the, the narration. Human beings like to frighten themselves, to walk through halls of warped mares and laugh at their distorted reflections. I think they like to wonder, is that who I am? Do I really look like that? And now I wonder, have I lived so long among them that I can no longer tell the difference? And that put up as she saves an American fighter jet that's on the side of a tyrant. She well, Wilson is so fucking good. Man, I knew, like, I didn't, I don't read G. Willow Wilson's other stuff. I just haven't. But... Damn, that is so on point. Oh, I love that. <sighs> anyway, uh, after saving the fighter pilot, she's attacked by Ares. And uh, you aid the tyrant against the oppressed. You are not worthy of the divine weapons you carry. I have returned to protect the weak, and if you have abandoned justice, then you must die like all the rest. Uh. Oh, sorry, Doc. My phone was buzzing at me. Maybe it's something important. I'm getting private messages. Uh, all kinds of stuff. Anyway. Sorry about that. I'll put it... Just in my pocket, so you guys don't get the rumbles through the mic. Uh, anyway, uh, so leave that scene with her on a cliffhanger. Uh, Steve Trevor's been captured by some mythological creatures. Um, oh, hey, whatever. Steve Trevor's been captured by some mythological creatures, so he has to, like, fight a griffith. <laughs> 
a bit and try to escape, but that doesn't really work out for him. Um, I like that panel. That's a cool panel. Yeah, and the, they take him back into custody, and they're going to go uh, take him to their leader, who's apparently a woman. Um, yeah. Whatever. Uh, damn good book. Damn good time to get into it. If you are not reading Wonder Woman, now is a great time to jump on. Uh, Nathan Snyder says, Will Wilson's run on Miss Marvel I enjoy a lot, so I was really excited she was going to do a good job writing Wonder Woman. Yeah. Smash Time says, I'm glad she's honest with the character. So am I. It's, it's very refreshing. Uh, and Smash Time says, wow, Wonder Woman cannot get any more interesting, right? I love this shit. you got to lean into the, the politics of the character. The character was made to be a political statement, so trying to divorce her from politics is just stupid. And now that we are in such a politically charged age, now is the time. Time to write Wonder Woman how she deserves to be written. Alrighty. Oof. I got a big book to go into next. Ah, uh, you'll have to forgive me. I'm gonna take a small break. Uh what can I what can I entertain you with? Let me do that. That'd be a fun one. What can I play for you to to make the time I'm gone more more palatable. I uh, got any music? Mm -hmm. Random music. Bacher Other Space. Here we go. Uh, screen color layout effects. <laughs> Um, can I turn the microphone into the speakers? Should be back now. I realized I turned off the webcam, which probably turned off any of the uh, audio I played while it's gone. I'll have to figure out how to get some hold music or something, because sometimes I just need a, a quick break in the middle of the show. I know that's not very professional for a live show, but you talk for an hour. All right, let me get through about half of this. I'm gonna talk with you guys in the comments. Smash Time says, seriously, she is a very political character, and yes, now is the time to write her a lot like this. I think so. I really do think so. Dark Knight Fan 75 is here. Hi, Dark Knight Fan 75. Alright. 
Oh, there is music. Right now? Huh. Weird. Should be gone. <sighs> what kind of music do I like? I'm pretty particular. Uh, I don't listen to much outside of the 70s. A lot of the music I like is classic rock. Pink Floyd's my favorite band, so that gives you a pretty good indication. Um, though over the last couple of years, I have branched out a bit more. There are a couple modern bands I quite like. Uh, that Handsome Devil being one of them. Uh, I like the bright eyes uh, if you're really into some moody shit. Um, but I don't listen to a lot of modern music, really. It, it's very sparse, but I don't listen to a lot of music, period. Uh, lately, I've been listening to a lot of Ninja Sex Party because I'm a big Game Grumps fan. Uh, for a couple months there, I was pretty much just only watching Game Grumps videos um, when I came home, for whatever reason. So, I've been starting to listen to a lot of Ninja Sex Party and getting their song stuck in my head. I love... Just how, like, intricate and, and honestly complex a lot of the lyrics in, and, and clever a lot of the lyrics in the Ninja Sex Party videos are. Uh, but then, you know, the, the song that really turned me on to him was uh, Danny Don't You Know, which is very, very deep, very emotional song, I'll say. Uh, it's still got some, like, silly stuff in it, but it's, it hits me right there. Every time I, I, I well up a little bit. Because I think because when I was a kid, I thought so much, like really young kid too, I thought so much about um, just about like how awful I was at things because I wasn't good at sports. I wasn't, I was smart, but not like particularly smart. Um, I wasn't really good at much of anything, didn't really belong anywhere, and so just that message just oh, it hit me right in place. <sighs> okay. I think I'm ready now. Let's go ahead and move on to Heroes in Crisis number three. I lied, I'm not ready. So one of the things I talked about with the first two issues uh, is that I was really, really interested in the one-on-one -on -one therapy sessions with the, um, the different superheroes and, and villains and whatever. I was super interested in those. And, like, almost had little to no interest in the murder mystery side of the story. Uh, to me, the entire book could be those interviews, could be those, those deep personal moments of these characters dealing with their trauma, confronting their, their inner demons, and experiencing therapy. That's the entire issue. Best issue of the series. Maybe there will be, period. Um, I... <sighs> There's six issues left. I understand that. But this is exactly what I wanted. Tom King wants to do just a sanctuary book. And I, I kind of just hope that it's just this. That it's just these these one-on-one -on -one standalone moments with these characters. Again, confronting their trauma and such. Um, because it's so 
perfect. And it's so hard to read the last days of Wally West, man. And then there's, so like there's all the emotion and stuff tied into it. But then there's like, The, the structural side of it is also really, really interesting. Um, the nine-panel grid, Tom King obviously famous for his nine-panel grids, but, like, the way this issue functions, yep, every, every page of it is so perfect. Wally... Booster, Lagoon Boy, Wally, Booster, Lagoon Boy, Wally, Booster, Lagoon Boy dies, Wally dies, Booster, Sanctuary. It's a perfectly structured issue. Every page. So you look at the first page, and first panel is Lagoon Boy, second panel is Lagoon Boy, third panel is Lagoon Boy, fourth panel is Wally, fifth panel is Wally, sixth panel is Wally, seventh panel is Booster, eighth panel is Booster, ninth panel is Booster. Or First panel is Lagoon Boy, second panel is Wally, third panel is Booster, fourth panel is Lagoon Boy, fifth panel is Wally, sixth panel is Booster. So you can read it two different ways, and it functions both ways. So that's a genius page. But then, yeah, you flip through the issue Lagoon Boy, Wally, Booster, Lagoon Boy, Add, Wally, Booster, Lagoon Boy, Add, Wally, add, Booster, Lagoon Boy, Wally, Booster. It's perfectly structured. It's a, it's a perfectly structured comic book. That's amazing. Um, and it gets, so like you have that, that brilliant structure so you're getting really, really in-depth look at each of these characters, why they're there, what's wrong, what's wrong with them, what, what is, is causing them pain, what makes them want to go to Sanctuary. And then it still tells a comprehensible story in a format that, that it would seem really hard to do, to focus on... To focus so heavily on character and yet tell the story of the last day of Sanctuary or, or the day of Sanctuary that everything went wrong. Um, and then you just get, you, you tell the story, it's still so, so comprehensible, but then you get moments that are just so hard. So like Sanctuary, it's revealed, has these like booths that are kind of like, um, I guess the, the comparison would be the holodeck on Star Wars. Or, not Star Wars. Whoa, I just pissed off some nerds there. The holodeck on Star Trek. Uh, but, like, it works by, by feeding into what you need, what you want. And it, it kind of tries to work off, uh, it helps you work off your trauma. Um... Booster at first doesn't know what he wants. Lagoon Boy keeps wanting to get shot by a laser because he's reliving the trauma of being shot. And Wally keeps being around his kids. Um, and Sanctuary asks him, the, the computer program, or robots, whatever, asks him, Ahem. 
Wally, Wally, is this enough? Is this what you want? Why here, Wally? What is it about Linda? Please, Wally, why Jai? Why Iris? Why do you need them? When you get to the end, and Wally's grasping his dying friend, he says, Roy, why? Why did it? The kids. I didn't want. I didn't want to be alone. What the fuck, Tom King? Why do you do this to us? Oh, man. Oh, it's just so hard to read that. It hurts, man. It really does. Still got two comics to go. I want to talk about this more, but I do need to wrap up tonight. It's a genius issue. Um, Eisner. Eisner. I've, I've talked about how I'd had a hard time connecting as deeply with this series as I did with something like Vision and Mr. Miracle. Not anymore. What's going on in the comments? Uh, finally, they completely explore the psychological aspects of these characters in this issue. Yep. DarkNetFan75 says, Why does this universe hate Wally? -E? People don't know what to do with Wally -E because DC now doesn't want to get rid of Barry. That's what it comes down to. No one knows what to do with Wally -E West without getting rid of Barry Allen. And I get it. I would certainly prefer Barry Allen to be back. Or Barry Allen be gone and Wally West be back. Same. Give it another couple years. It's going to flip again. And then give it a couple years after that. And someone will hate both of them. And we'll have Black Wally Flash. Or give it a couple years after that. And someone will hate all of them. And we'll get a completely new Flash. It's comics. That's how it works. People need to stop saying that that DC and Marvel hates this character. No one hates it. The, the guy, the people in charge don't know what to do with him because they didn't grow up with that character. They don't know how to write that character. Uh, Philip Cutton says, I hear it had something to do with the head of DC right now, but I'm not entirely sure. Dark Knight Fan 75 says, yes, Dan Didio. Yeah, sure, Dan Didio doesn't like Wally West, but Tom King wrote well, wrote the issue. Let's focus on what Tom King did with it and stop treating it like it's all a decision on top. If Tom King didn't want to kill Wally West, he would have said, no, I don't want to do that in my book. That's going to be too big of a distraction. Uh... I don't get it. Why don't I have two Flash at the same time? Make a comic named Team Flash. No one's good at writing it. Uh, Dark Knight Fan 75 says, I'm so sorry, but I don't need DC Comics for deep philosophical issues and our heroes dying on, or on the verge of killing themselves. I do. I mean, if you want crazy escapism and, and goofy silliness, there's comics for that. They're DC comics for that. Don't read this. That's fine. I, I can recommend some books if you want. Uh, <laughs> like, really, uh, you know, I was kind of talking about it, and, and I didn't have much positive to say on it tonight, but no grand philosophizing here. It's just kind of fun space adventure stuff. There's some 
dumb silliness in it. Um, that's you know par for the course, but it's it's fun. It's cool. It's it's kind of like a different adventure every week. This one's got deep political connections and stuff, but if you don't really pay attention to the politics in it for some goddamn reason, um, seriously, it's Wonder Woman fighting Ares again. This, yeah, don't read this. If you're not into that, yeah, I wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. Um, though I think you should challenge yourself more. Let's say that. Uh, I, I, it's, it's nothing against you. I don't want to feel like I'm attacking you or anything, but if, if you, yeah, if you don't want to read that, that's totally understandable, but, like, why shouldn't those of us who want that be able to? Um, even action! Uh, not... Not much going on here that's really deep or philosophical or, or anything to do with deep drama. I mean, there's like some interesting stuff going on with Lois and um, and Clark, but it's not like super above just, you know, random drama in their relationship like we've been doing for years. All right. I need to continue, because I'm now keeping my wife awake, and that's bad. Speaking of Action Comics, number 1002. Um, I still really like these. We get to see the, the characters at the Daily Planet's desks. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's Miss Moon. Or, no, Miss Good. Sorry, Miss Good. Um... The mobsters of the Invisible Mafia are having a secret meeting to try to buy a Dial H for Hero um, thing when the question shows up and kicks the living shit out of them, which was pretty cool, except uh, one survives. I love that the question just looks completely like Rorschach there. Um, what was the, uh, the line in here that I thought was really funny? It was something she said. Damn it. Was it like issues later? Man, I gotta try. To, I, this was like one of the first books I read, so I'm having a little, um,. I'm terrible at this. I'm a terrible reviewer. Maybe it's in the beginning, I'm just not remembering it correctly. Man, I swear there was a thing, I'm like, aha, he's making fun of Marvel. And now I really cannot... Oh, there it was. Okay, it wasn't her, but it was above her. All right. So he's trying to sell this, uh, this guy's trying to sell this Dial H for Hero thing to this mobster that's supposed to give you superpowers. And he's explaining that he doesn't know whether or not it works and he's afraid to see if it works because he doesn't know if there's going to be a cost associated with it. Um, and secondly, to be fair, to be completely upfront, I don't know if it's one of those things where there's a cost to it. Like, you dial this, now you owe Satan your marriage or something. That cracked me the fuck up. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm so sorry. I couldn't remember precisely what it was. But like I said, I read it earlier in the day. But I remembered that there was that little dig at Marvel real quick. And I was like, oh, Bendis is having a little too much fun there. Um, 
Anyway, Clayton shows up, beats the fuck out of people. Uh, not a lot happens this issue. It's mostly just a lot of, like, intrigue and stuff. Uh, the fire chief goes to talk to Clark Kent and says she's being uh, kind of kind of threatened by the mayor a little bit and being told that she's not going to work in Metropolis if she keeps accepting help from superheroes. So that was kind of interesting. Um and then Superman gets attacked by the Red Cloud, uh, and he's not able to really do anything besides run away from it at super speed. Uh, he tries to just blow it away and use heat vision and all that stuff, and it doesn't really work. Uh, so he has to fly away in order to survive. Um, and then the Red Cloud kind of comes into form and is like, well, damn. I just went face to face against the greatest of all time and I live to tell the tale. I can chase off Superman. Well, well, that changes everything. That's a story. Front page. And big surprise, it's, it's Miss Good, who's been this, you know, kind of shady character the whole time. She's the, the Red Cloud. Uh, cash to anyone who won that bet. <laughs> It, it was a fine issue. I like all the mystery and intrigue. This is one that I probably should have spent more time on, but I spent a lot of time talking about Heroes in Crisis. Um, I, I, I don't really have much to say about it. It's, it's just fine. It's building more than it's doing anything else. A lot of talking in a Bendis book. <gasps> what? <laughs> I want Tom King... And Brian Michael Bendis to write a book together and just just to hear... Or I want them to try because it'll never work. I want them to try to write a book together and just hear all the debates about how much dialogue there should be. <laughs> oh, the savagery. Because Tom King would be like, no, we'll say it all in five words and then we'll just repeat them five times. And Bendis is like, no. We'll have a bunch of quirky dialogue. <laughs> oh, man. Alrighty. Finally, let's talk about Star Wars Darth Vader number 24. This one I read through in, like, seriously five minutes because it is almost entirely action. Um, last we left, Vader's castle was under attack by the natives of Mustafar. Um, so he joins the fray and starts slicing up evil creatures and stuff lava lice i think they call them um but the mystic elders of mustafar call upon the blood of mustafar to engulf the invading army and we get just this really cool double page spread of a lava wave a lava like tsunami um consuming all of the imperial army the cost was dear but we have won the dark one is destroyed by the blood of mustafar we are saved Effective, I'll give Charles Soul this, effective placement of a double page ad. Vorder, Vader uses a force bubble to save himself and uh, quickly has to get away from all of the, the ocean of lava. And I do, I do legit like this scene. It's all done silently. And it's a really, really great moment. This is a great page for Vader. Not gonna lie, that is a great page for Vader. Again, stranded on the, the shores of the lava ocean of Mustafar. Completely decimated. Just gets up, covered, but this time he manages actually to crawl and get up, covered in flames, and then he uses the force to extinguish them and walks on. That's, that's really good. Walks on, gets in the castle, and they're like, oh no, quickly, we must destroy the entire castle. And he calls on the force and uses it to summon the lava oceans of Mustafar and destroy his enemies. 
But that's not all. Darth Maman still survives and is now renewed into a fresh body that has access to the Force and lightsabers, a version of his old body or something. Um, and Vader may have been more skilled, but Maman's fresh and Vader's just been literally through hell. So he's able to defeat him while, of course, like any good Sith Lord, lecturing him about how he doesn't um, understand the dark side. Uh, and just just really, really getting into him. Do not forget, Vader, that I saw into you as you saw into me. You know my story, but I also know yours. They called you the Chosen One, and you believed it. You believe it still. You think the dark side serves you, obeys your every childish whim. But if the greatest power in the galaxy is actually yours to control, why are you a stub of charred meat in a cape? Oh! Ouch! Even more, if you had that power, wouldn't your wife be alive? The dark side does not serve us. We serve the dark side. If we glorify it through our acts and our work and our art, it gives us power. It gives us life, even life eternal. Empires have risen and fallen since my birth. Great ages of the galaxy have passed, but here I stand. But if we do not serve, if we fight the will of the dark side, try to control it, then, well, just look at you. Is able to be defeated. Um, but Vader uses the dark side, uses reaches out with the force, and throws a rock at Mom and pinning, Mom and pinning him up against the wall. And Mom says, You dare? You're not powerful enough to hold me, Vader. The dark side loves me. It wants me to live. If that is true, Mom and then you will. <laughs> but I am... I am Lord Moment. Dead. And then Vader uh, uses all the summoning power that the castle creates in order to try to reach into time with the Force. It's just really good stuff. I, I I can't lie. Soul started out really shaky for me. I thought the beginning of his run was was pretty weak. This is leading up to be a very, very nice conclusion. I'm really liking a lot of the choices that he's made along the way. Um I didn't have much to talk about with the Marvel preview, and now that I'm going over where I wanted to be. I'm not going to talk about it too much. Um, there's just a handful of books I saw as I was flipping through it that I thought interested me. Um, so I'll probably talk about those and just say, hey, I might get this. I'm considering Guardians of the Galaxy just because Cosmic Ghost Rider, and I really like Cosmic Ghost Rider. Uh, it's too silly and crazy for words, and uh, Donnie Cates is writing it, so that should be fun. Um, this is a teaser image that is stupid and ridiculous, and I love it. I'm not reading the book, but it's just peak Marvel. Old Man Quill's apparently going to thing. Again, not, not gonna, going to be a thing. Not going to read it, but just funny that it exists. Uh, pretty soon there's going to be an old man everybody, and everyone just survived into the future for whatever reason. Um, I just like this cover for this issue of Thor. That's, that's cute. Uh, no, keep forgetting that Captain America with um, coats is still going. Uh, Friendly Neighborhood Spider-Man. When's the first issue of that out? It's saying issue three in January, so I'm hoping the first issue is a m sometime this month, or maybe I missed it. I hope not. Uh, I may have to pick up Spider-Man slash Deadpool number 46 just because I really do love this cover that's just making fun of 
I think it's mostly Marvel, but pretty much all comics and, and how they advertise big events. Um, Infinite House of Civil Yet Secret Crisis War Invasion. <laughs> The biggest story ever, the earth-shattering saga that will change everything. The Marvel Universe will never be the same. Yeah, that's every Marvel teaser. I like that. Well, oh, what else is coming out? The Killmonger series is going to be at number four of five in January? Have I just not been seeing this thing? I'm interested in that. Um... <laughs> Not sure what else I got here. La 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 la. A bunch of Star Wars stuff. Age of the Republic, I don't think I'll be buying. Marvel Action Black Panther number two. With Wakanda plagued by deadly weather, Black Panther must discover what or who is behind the events before more of his people suffer. Luckily, he has his sister Shuri and mother Ramonda by his side to ready to help. Um, it's not written by Coates. written by Kyle Baker, so I'll probably read that. Uh, statues and such. Yeah, I don't think there's much else I have much interest in. Um... Bunch of collections. Yeah, I don't know. So, might have to pick up an issue of uh, Deadpool and Spider Man. Probably gonna get Marvel Black Panther, not by Coats, whatever that book was called. You should probably remember that. The thing is, I always see these, I'm like, oh yeah, that'd be cool. And then I forget about them until they're out, and then I maybe don't see them on the stands when they're out. And that's always disappointing. Um,. So I really hope Friendly Neighborhood Spider-Man hasn't started yet. I haven't seen anyone else talking about that one. I assume I would. Um, yeah, I got, got nothing. Nothing else really to say. Um, I'm just excited for, you know, other stuff. Uh, it was just kind of funny today, though, at the comic shop. I'll tell this story and sign off real quick. Um, my comic, uh, one of the guys at the comic shop knows me at this point. knows I'm all dc almost entirely uh and he goes do you want this marvel preview might have some star wars books in it. i'm like oh, come on i'm like i'm not that bad i like marvel somewhat <laughs> so he gave me this and i'm just gonna have to call him uh tomorrow and and add a couple books just to to prove a point all right everyone i think that will do it for comic reviews thanks very much for sticking with me uh, I will catch y'all later. Bye.